Hello, good day. Uh, so today we're going to talk about operative management for normal size kidney stones, uh, generally stones that are less than 15 millimeters to two centimeters. Um, and we probably already talked about this in the office, which is why you're watching this video, but just to go over the options again, uh, the two options for operative management are shockwave lithotripsy and laser lithotripsy for this type of stone. So the reasons to go after a stone, um, again, just to reiterate, reiterate uh, is if the stone is symptomatic, so you're having off and on pain on that side, and there's no other good explanation, even though it's not blocking you, that is a reason to go after the stone. Uh, or there's a significant amount of stone burden to begin with that, um, you know, and it looks like it's about to pass, like if it's located right on the outflow, um, or if it's completely obstructing already a ureteral stone, um, or if the stones are growing, um, you know, on a surveillance ultrasound, we're checking ultrasound, come back, and now the stone has grown. Um, or a CAT scan shows that it has grown. Those are kind of the reasons that generally we say, okay, we probably need to do something about this. And so again, for stones less than two centimeters, generally, um, the options are laser lithotripsy and shockwave lithotripsy. So both of them have their merits. Um, and a lot of times you can go either way. Um, but generally speaking, for shockwave lithotripsy, I prefer to recommend that if we're talking about a single stone in the middle of the kidney or the upper pole of the kidney, where if we fragment that stone, those fragments will then pass and they won't get stuck in the lower pole of the kidney. Um, you can do this for any stone up to two centimeters. It's great if you can catch it around a centimeter or less because anything more than that, you know, you, these fragments that get generated from shockwave lithotripsy are, you know, just kind of made from the shockwave. You're not looking at them directly and, and whittling them down to something that you know is going to pass. So again, what shockwave is, is, you know, we do, you know, either sedation or anesthesia, depending on the anesthesia provider. Uh, and there's this like bubble of uh, that goes right here. And it generates these triangulated shock waves right on the stone, usually a couple thousand of those. Um, and then it makes fragments and you pass the fragments. Um, so that again is great for those scenarios. The big merit of shock wave is that nothing goes inside of you. There is no stent, which everybody hates stents, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the the downside is you have to pass fragments yourself. So, you know, as far as the risks of shockwave go, we don't really worry too much about infection. We actually don't prescribe antibiotics um, prior to shockwave lithotripsy anymore, unless there's a urinalysis that shows an infection preoperatively. Um, but we do worry about bleeding. So the chance of a significant bleed with a shockwave lithotripsy is about 2%. And by significant bleed, I mean like you're getting admitted to the hospital and maybe having that bleeding, a procedure to stop that bleeding. That's a 2% risk. And then, um, you know, the risk of those fragments not being able to pass on their own and you end up needing a stent uh, is dependent on the size of the stone. But generally speaking, it's about 5 to 10% chance that, you know, the fragments get stuck. We give it a little while, you know, as long as your pain is well controlled and it still doesn't pass. And now we have to go in and put it in a stand and maybe do a laser. Um, that's a five to 10% chance. Um, but when, when it works, it's, it's fantastic. If it's a one centimeter upper pole stone, you fragment it well, the, the fragments pass. It's like magic. You get an ultrasound four weeks later and boom, it's gone. Uh, patient had minimal pain, no stent, nothing went inside the patient. So that's a big plus for shockwave lithotripsy for the right patient. Um, laser lithotripsy. And so when you hear lithotripsy, people talk usually about shockwave, but lithotripsy means break up stone. Um, so there's shockwave lithotripsy and laser lithotripsy. So laser lithotripsy, we're going up with a camera, looking at it under direct vision, taking a laser, breaking up those fragments, usually basketing out a small fragment, uh, really for analysis. The laser technology has changed recently with the thulium laser that now, you know, you can really fragment these particles into just nothing. Um, and so rather than basketing out all these kind of sort of larger fragments, 
we I've been just dusting them. Um, and there's been good uh, evidence to show that there is a significant difference for people now um, in terms of just dusting them into oblivion. So if we already know what stone you form, I probably won't do a basket um, since we're really doing it for analysis. If this is your first stone, we don't know what you're forming, then I do take a fragment. So we know what stones you form. Um, but anyway, we go up with a uh, uh, scope. And so in, in this scenario, when the kidney stone is all the way up at the kidney and it's big enough that we're gonna do something about it, we usually do use what's called an access sheath. And what that is, is a, a tube, kind of a cylinder, okay, that we gently pass into the ureter to allow the scope to then go in and out and allow for flow. Because what we need is this scope is gonna run water through so that all kind of the particular matter can get washed through so we can see what we're doing. And that access sheath provides an outflow. Um, so in general, we're gonna use an access sheath if we're talking about this in the office and we're electively scheduling this for a kidney stone. Um, I am a big proponent of not using stents, but in this scenario, we need to use a stent after because we have used an access sheath. There was no stent in previously, so we have to do a stent. Um, if we don't do a stent, then you're gonna have way more pain uh, and blockage, potentially a bad infection, needing an emergency procedure to get a stent in. Um, and it's, you know, been shown that in that scenario, it definitely is not worth trying it without a stent. If you use an access sheet and there's no prior stent, there's a whole bunch of other scenarios. Uh, generally speaking, if you've had a previous stent in and we're taking that out at the time of the procedure, then you're fine. Don't need a stent unless there's something observed intraoperatively. If you have a stone that's way down low and it's blocking you way down low, then probably can get away without a stent, um, the majority of the time. But in this scenario, you know, we have to put a stent. And the reason why I'm kind of belaboring this is because everybody hates stents. So um, we will set you up for an appointment to have your stent removed in the office a week after the procedure. Um, I do not do the string, and that is because the string can lead to the stent getting coming out. Um, and if the stent comes out in this scenario, that's bad because, again, in this scenario, you need a stent. Um, what I found is in... The scenarios where I, people put in a string, those are the ones I, I just don't put a stent in at all. Um, but in this, you know, here we got to put in a stent. So we do use the access sheath. We do use a stent. There will be a procedure to remove the stent. That's about a week later. We go in, I go in with a tiny scope um, and pull that out from the bladder. Um, it really isn't too bad. Um, for men, we do use a numbing jelly um, and it takes about 30 seconds. So the issue with the stent is that it can cause two problems uh, in terms of symptoms. The first is that little coil that's, in, again, the stent is this 24 centimeter long plastic straw with a coil on either side. Um, and uh, so that coil that's down in the bladder can maybe tickle the bladder and cause you to go to the bathroom more often than you usually would. Also, when you do go to the bathroom, that pressure from your bladder gets transmitted back up the stent. Your kidney is not used to feeling that pressure and it can cause pain when you go to the bathroom. Um, most people do get used to stents if they have them long-term. We do have patients that live with stents to keep their kidney open for other reasons. Um, and they generally get used to it over time. But if you've never had a stent before, it's a, a new experience for sure. There is medicine that I will prescribe for you after um, to help with that, but in general, um, you know, the stent can be a little bit bothersome. So that is the downside of uh, laser with uh, but the upside is now I'm under direct vision. I know exactly how big the fragments are. Um, their risk of bleeding is really minimal. There is a 2% risk of infection that's significant uh, infection with this procedure because there is a scope now going up your urinary tract and blasting away these stones. Um, also with uh, the ureteroscopy, anytime we put that scope into the ureter, there is a 1% chance of like an injury to the ureter. Um, and then there is a five to 10% chance we safely can't access the ureter without um, injuring the ureter. And in that case, I would leave a stent, wait a couple of weeks, let that passively dilate, and then come back, 
get, take out the stone, take out the stent. In that case, I would take the stent out right in the operating room since you were now pre-stented. Um, so that's basically it for risks and benefits of laser lithotripsy and shockwave lithotripsy. I hope you have a great day.